Okay, how about now? Okay. I can't tell in the small room whether this is on or not. Because my voice carries anyhow whether it's on or not. So. This thing fits so loose. Is there a reason? The people who usually have this have a bigger head than I do. Seems so loose. Oh, well. If it falls off, I'll uh, do something else. But a mighty stand for God. John Carter tells a story when he was doing evangelism in Russia in uh, 1992 in this one town that the governor of the area of the town where he was going to do this, his name was Boris Nutsov, and he sent guards and military people to where they were having the evangelistic series to project, protect the meetings, to guard against the vandals and hooligans and other people who might uh, disrupt the meeting. So they had this big hall they were meeting in. Uh, it was a sports palace hall. And as Carter began to speak, some of the hooligans threw some firebombs up on the stage. Immediately, the Russian pastors and Boris's guards quickly put the fire out, and John continued speaking. And there's a silence over the crowd. It didn't cause the crowd to panic. It was a silence over it, because they had lived so many years with oppression that now they had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus. And so whatever happened didn't uh, distract them to be able to hear the good news. They were hungry for it. See, Boris is not afraid to stand up against his enemies. In fact, uh, he had stood his ground against the government when they tried to build a nuclear power plant in his area. So the people respected his stand. At the hotel where the Carter congregation uh, delegation was meeting, he also sent guards to guard that area because the Russian mafia was going to do all they could to cause conflict with Carter's group. Because of this, Carter uh, and his team met with Boris's team, and they spent several hours talking about the Bible, about God, about freedom, about democracy. And Boris was very impressed and respected what he heard. His sister was along. She was a doctor. And she was so impressed that she came to the meetings and became a baptized member. So what I like about Boris is the fact that he stood for what he understood was right despite enemies. And sad to say, several years later, he was assassinated on a bridge in Moscow, probably because of some enemies he had made. The point, the reason I made this, this story is here's a man who made a mighty stand for God on the limited understanding of what he knew about God and his respect towards God. We're called today to stand for Jesus. We're called today to make a stand for God, to make a commitment to the truth, to make a firm stand in the last days. In fact, it says in right before the famous verse in Revelation in Matthew 24, 14, where he says, when the gospel is preached in all the world's a testimony, then the end will come. He says in verse 13, he says, everyone who endures or stands or perseveres shall be saved. And we need to make a stand and persevere. And it says in the, in the quote in um, Hebrews 12, one where it talks about the fact that they were in a Christian race, he says, run the race with perseverance, the same as with endurance, and they're making a stand. Much like Telemachus did. Telemachus was a, um, a Christian man, a monk, who in about the two or 300 A.D. was impressed by God to go to Rome. He didn't know why, he just, God gave him the impression to go to Rome. So as he came into the large city of Rome, and was walking around, he saw there was a lot of excitement going on, especially as he neared the Colosseum. And then he understood why. In that Colosseum, they were going to have continuation of the gladiator fights. And you know, those were two military men who would get up there and fight to the death. And now he understood why he needed to be there. So he walked into the stadium and everybody was all seated and the first two gladiators came out to fight and the people were all anticipatory of what was going to happen. And he came and walked out into the fight right between the two men and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop this. Well, the people started laughing and started booing and uh, one of the gladiators wanted to get into the fight and we didn't want this guy interfering so he came along and knocked him down like that with the back of his hand. 
As they got in to start to fight again, he got up and he stood between the men again. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop this. Well, now the booze got stronger because the people paid their good money to see blood and gore. And they, one of the people starts shouting, run them through, run them through. And that's exactly what one of the gladiators did. Took his sword and ran it through like that. And he fell to the ground in a pool of blood. He pushed himself back up on his feet. And as he was staggering there, about ready to fall over again, he said in a hoarse whisper, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop this. And then he collapsed and died. A silence came over the stadium, and within about 10 or 15 minutes, the stadium emptied, and that was the last gladiator fight. All because a man took a stand. His stand cost him his life, but all because he took a stand. This morning, what I want to talk about is Christians can witness and be an influence in the end time by taking three stands for Jesus. This morning, I want to look in the Bible about a story of some men who took a stand, and they, they demonstrate three stands we may need to make. This morning, if you have, and I'm glad you have a bulletin insert because you might want to tear it in half and put one in 1 Chronicles 11 and the other in 2 Samuel 23 because we'll be going back and forth between those two sets of Bible verses. 1 Chronicles 11 and 2 Samuel 23. The first stand that we need to make is we need to stand our ground together. For it says in Chronicle, 1 Chronicles 10.10, 10, it says, These were the chiefs of David's mighty men. They together with all of Israel. Together. These mighty men together with all of Israel. See, there's a reason why the Mormons send out by two. Why the Jehovah Witnesses have a congregation to come to your house to talk. There's a reason we send call porters out by two. Because there's strength in numbers. Together, working together and coming together. We go to the uh, National Forest up there south of uh, Yosemite called sequoia and you have a large some large groves you have these gigantic sequoia trees that go several hundred feet in the air and you almost get your neck strained trying to see the tops and we say oh man those gigantic trees their roots must go way down deep to be able to stand that tall during a storm and during blizzards and during what happens but they don't their roots do not go deep their roots stay rather shallow but they go out and they intertwine with the roots of the other sequoia trees so that during storms they are supporting one another together good illustration of what we need to be doing in the, in, in the church you see protesters go out when they protest and they lock arms together so they make a stronger united stand against in their protest it used to be that pro football players on kickoffs could go run downfield and join arms and and come right and come down and block as a wall they don't allow that anymore because it's dangerous apparently so what was the result of these men standing together? It says, again, in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, chapter 11, verse 10, it says, David's mighty men, together with all Israel, gave the kingship strong support to extend his land. See, by coming together and standing together as a church, we give the kingship, in this case, our pastor, support to extend the land. What is the pastor in the church supposed to be doing? Extending the message. Giving the good news. Extending the land. Bringing people in. And so we need to come together and work together and support. There's a reason why that helps to support the pastor, the board, the departments, to extend the gospel, support the school, support the teachers, support the principal. Coming together and standing together to bring support. As you read in the Ephesians today, the reason we need to come together is because we're not battling a lightweight enemy. As you mentioned over here a while ago, what was going on with court. You're not battling a lightweight enemy. We're battling a strong spiritual force. And it's rough to do it by ourselves. Thus, as a church, we need to come together together. There is a reason that to imitate these mighty men who came together. Hebrews 10.25 says this. Let us not give up meeting together, together. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. This is written almost 2,000 years ago. Now, don't snore while you're back there, okay? <laughs> you're going to make me want to do that. 
He says, as some are in the habit of doing. 2,000 years ago, people were already in the habit of not coming to church. <laughs> he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing it. But as we come together, he says, let us encourage one another all the more as the capital D-A-Y approaches. What do you think the capital D-A-Y is? What? The second coming. So as we closer we get to the end time and closer we get before Jesus comes, it's important to be together, not be separate. Now I know some people can't always come to church every week and some people because of health issues can't come at all. And so their church has to be, thankfully they can get 3ABN or something like that and be blessed that way. But um, how important it is if we can be here to be together as a church, to, be together, to work together. So we need to stand our ground together. Number two, the second stand, is we need to stand our ground with action. Well, let me, go, let me back up a minute because there's a story I forgot to t tell right here. We need to stand our ground together. In 1861, when the Civil War started, one of the first big battles of the Civil War was the battle at Bull Run. In fact, it was fought there twice, beginning of the battle war and near the end. In this first big battle, it was the first big giant confrontation between North and South, just right outside Washington, D.C. In fact, some of the wealthy people of Washington, D.C., hearing that battle is going to take place, got in their carriages, packed some lunch, and came out and parked along the ridge to watch the battle as if it was they were watching a football game. And so that day, you had young men from both the North and the South coming and fighting their first big battle. These men who had been encouraged and go out and show honor and valor and go out and, you know, and fight in the battle and your bravery, and they probably got all wound up about that. And then once the battle started, they realized the bullets were real. And as the battle went on, this battle of Bull Run, men were falling on both sides. And men turned around and ran. In fact, if you've ever seen the movie The Blue and the Gray, which was done back in the 80s, they show this battle. And they show what happened on both sides. Once people started falling and dying, they, men started running. And so up on this one ridge, behind some rocks, many of them took off and were running away from the south. The gray coats were running away when the general came riding up to them and said, what are you men doing? Why are you running? Then he said, now look, there's General Jackson standing like a stone wall on his horse. And Jackson was, General Jackson was running back and forth along the lines with his horse, encouraging the men to line up and take their stand and keep fighting during the battle rather than running. He said, look at Jackson standing like a stone wall. We need to do the same thing. And his rallying cry and Jackson doing that turned people around to go back together and fight and that's how Stonewall Jackson got his name because of that battle and because of standing strong so we need to stand our ground together number two we need to stand our ground with action Talabacus took action he stood right in the middle of the battle and took action Stonewall Jackson took action it says in 2nd Samuel 23 it's starting at verse 9 it says Eliezer gathered with for battle and the men of Israel were retreating but Eliezer stood his ground struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and was frozen to the sword talk about and, and the Bible tells us that both he and Shema do the same, did the same thing and they stood in the middle of the battleground and took the men on and they stood their ground and had a great victory till their hand grew frozen to the sword see they didn't use their sword then put it away and use their sword and put it away their hand was uh, the sword was in their hand the whole time to the point where they probably had to have it peeled off when the battle was over we needed the same thing and here's our sword and we need to be so committed to what's in this book and apply it every day and read it every day and put it in our life every day and not put it away and be committed as we have our daily battles because we have our daily battles. I heard a few of them this morning in prayer. We have our daily battles. And we're not fighting a lightweight enemy. Eliezer and Shema both stood their ground in the middle of the field, not on the edge so if the going got rough they could take off, but in the middle of the field, in the middle of the field of lentils and barley, they were protecting something that was important to them. What's important to us as Christians and what do we stand up for? They stood there while others fled. See, being a Christian is a verb just as much as it is being a noun and being an adjective. It means action. 
And that's what these men did. If you read the Gospel Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, he says, go, make, baptize, teach, all verbs. Meaning action, do something about it. Stonewall stood there in action. I was watching a film last night, I think it was called Come Sunday, and it was a true film about a Christian man who had a gigantic church, and he felt the Lord speak to him on an issue, and I'm not going to get into what the issue was about, but he took a stand, and he had a gigantic church, uh, a multinational church, both black and white, meeting together, big church in Tulsa, and he got up there and he, he brought his personal belief that came to him, he felt from God. And when he did that, what he said, you could hear the rumbles throughout the audience. And that week, some of the elders came and talked to him. What were you doing? Did you think this through? He says, well, I've been praying about it. I'll come back. So the next week, he came back to preach and tried to you know, clear things up. And the clear things up got worse. And people were just getting up and walking out. And the end result, that a church that was had five or 6,000 people in it, finally were meeting with about 100 people. And they were meeting in a room not much bigger than this. It really threw him. And what I was thinking about this morning as I saw that story, and I would have some disagreement with what his beliefs were. I think he needed to have more understanding of what he was taking a stand on. But he had this time where he was called to meet with the bishops at this one area. And as he came into this room and this, this church, it was a round like church like that, and you have all these bishops around here listening to him as he came in to explain his understanding of things. And he was challenged for it. Well, when I watched that, I was immediately reminded of the story I have right here in the Bible, Martin Luther. When Martin Luther, this man who joined uh, the church to become a priest and went through all sorts of hassle trying to be, have peace with God, trying to do, he couldn't do enough works, he felt, to be at peace with God. And finally, one of his mentors told him to read the Bible, read the Bible, find joy in the Bible. Well, he read the Bible and he found the truth. And you know the story of Martin Luther going out and giving, expounding upon his truth in various places, writing about it, writing one day 95 statements against the church and nailing it to the church uh, door so everybody could walk by and see it. It became instant news. If it had been today, people would have been taking pictures of it and sending it Instagram and all these other things. <laughs> it was a little slower back then, but still that information got out. And so he had that famous meeting at the Diet of Worms. And he came there, he thought it was going to be a debate like he'd had other times having a debate. And in that meeting hall, just like in the movie I watched last night, in this meeting hall were all these head honchos. Some of them supported Luther. Many of them were all stuck with the church. And so he thought it was going to be a debate. And he had his writings all set out there, and he thought it was going to be a debate. And the man came out and said, we have two questions for you. Are these your writings? He says, yes, they are. He says, will you recant? He says, I don't understand. I thought we were going to have a debate. I don't understand this. And there's a lot of controversy. And he says, give me time. So they said, we'll give you till tomorrow. So if you've ever seen the movie, either the black and white or maybe the updated one, he spent that whole night in prayer. And then he came before the group again the next day. And they said, Martin Luther, what's your, what's your message? He says, well, everything I wrote here can't all be in disagreement with the church. And he talked about some of these things. And they talked about some of the things that he did write. And they said, we don't want to hear it anymore. He says, what are you going to do? And this is what he said. He said, unless you can tell me from, teach me and convince me from scriptures that what I wrote was wrong. And if you've ever seen the movie, he, his lips were quivering. It was such a tense time. He says, I cannot and I will not recant. And it was, it was almost a tension. You could see it. I cannot and I cannot recant. And when he said that, then he just kind of relaxed. He says, here I stand. I can do none other. Oh, it threw the whole group of men they got together after and they said what should we do with this guy and they said well he's a heretic for what he believes and we don't have to defend a heretic we don't have to give him safe passage so Martin Luther was taken off and he left to go back to his uh, home and he never got there because one of the men who was in the group Prince Frederick King Frederick came and kidnapped him and took him to his castle where he kept him protected for two years during that time Martin Luther wrote the New Testament in German so the German people could read the good news about Jesus. 
he took a stand, he stood his ground with action, as did Telemachus, as did Stonewall Jackson. So number one, we need to stand our ground together. Number two, we need to stand our ground with action, and we do that. The end result, number three, we will stand our ground for victory from God. For it says in uh, 2 Samuel 23, verse uh, 11, next to him Shema, when the Philistines banded together at the place where the field was full of lentils, uh, Israel's troops fled from them, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field, as I just said. He too with Eliezer, hand on the sword. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and look at the last part of verse 12, and the Lord brought about a great victory. And if you go over here in uh, Chronicles, it says the same thing. But they, uh, but they took their stand in the middle of the field, they defended and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. This morning, before I came here, I spoke to the Spanish group in Petaluma and talked about another story in Samuel about where God brought a great victory as the people made a, a, a commitment to God. Another sermon, another time. But I was, thought, I, I was impressed with the way God brought a victory in this other story in Samuel by just sending thunder. Today, God wants to bring about great victories in our lives against Satan and against sin, against trials and against temptations. So we need to make the two previous two stands. We need to stand our ground together. We need to stand our ground with action. And as we do that, according to these two stories, which are basically the same, found in two places, um, as we take these two stands, as we become frozen to the sword, God will give us great victories. So we need to, Psalms 37, 5, commit our way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do it. We need to, as it says in uh, James 4, 7 and 8, submit ourselves before the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and he will draw near, near to us. And verse 10 says, as we humble ourselves, he will lift us up. We need to trust what God says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where it says, no trial or temptation has come upon us that's not common to all people. We're all in the same boat. But God is faithful. He will not let us be tempted beyond what we can handle. Because we can handle it because He gives the way of escape. Not us, but He gives the way of escape. And I love how Paul explains it over here in Romans, very famous set of verses that Romans 8 says, and it goes like this. It talks about prayer. It talks about in all things where God works together for good for those who love the Lord. In verse 31 of Romans 8 says, What then? What shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, he will, not also, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who can bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? Is it God who justifies? Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ who died more than that, who was raised the dead, for the dead, from the dead, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? It is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered sheep to slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Amen? More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor powers, neither the height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. That's good news, isn't it? Amen. Fantastic news, isn't it? Let me finish with this story taking place in Russia, as you know, many, many years ago, before the walls fell and Perestroika and Glasnost happened and Gorbachev happened, that you, as a Christian, you were taking your life in your hands by worshiping. We could not be doing what we're doing right now. Well, maybe we could do it once in a while, but we had to be very quiet about it. So there was a group of people, about 40, who were meeting in this one spot, and they kept things quiet. In fact, when they sang, they sang like this. So no one can hear them. And as they were worshiping, suddenly the doors burst open and two military men walked in with big guns. 
and they told everybody, get up and line up along the wall. And people got up and lined up against the wall. And they were pointing their guns at him. He says, okay, we're not too mean. If any of you want to make a decision and leave now, you can. And about six or ten people left. And he told everybody else, keep your hands up. So everybody like this shaking. He says, okay, we'll give you one more chance. If anybody else wants to leave, you can leave. And another eight or nine or ten people left. And he says, oh, and then the guy, and then he, they cocked their gun and pointed at the people and said, we want you to get your hands up. So people hands up like this. And we want you to praise God with your hands raised. And they go, what? And the men smile and they said, about a month and a half ago, we broke up a meeting like this. And rather than people being frightened, they stood there in their stand for Jesus. And they explained Jesus to us. And they explained, explained why they were meeting and what Jesus means to them and who Jesus can be for us. And he said they just loved on us. And we gave our life to Jesus. So now we've come in here to help you out. And then he makes the statement at the end. We are sorry we had to scare you, he said. But unless we are willing to die or stand our ground for our faith, we cannot fully be trusted and found faithful. Amen. You know, luckily right now we can worship without any problems. Apparently there's going to be a time when we can. And we know there are people in the world who can't worship as freely as we are doing right now. Which makes me hit my head wondering why more and more people are running to churches when they have the opportunity to freely come and worship whatever church it might be. But Jesus wants us today, as we get closer and closer to before he comes, to stand our ground. That's why he says, those who endure or stand their ground in the end will be, not might be, but will be saved. Isn't that good news? So this morning, as I pray, I'm asking you to make a decision right now to stand your ground. You might say, well, I made that decision. Well, every day we need to make, we need to make that decision, don't we? Every day we need to come to Jesus because Lamentations tells us that his love is fresh and new every morning. So we need to grasp it and take it and make that decision. Let's pray. And Lord, right now we want to make a decision for you. It's easy right now to talk about this and hear about this when we're uh, at church and not uh, persecuted and having troubles. But we know when we step outside this church, as the lady over here mentioned with the court date and other things going on, there are hassles and problems and struggles and trials. Sometimes we can, can barely get home after church without having the trials and struggles already slapping us in the face. So I ask now, Lord, that we will make a decision to you. You said, commit your way to you, trust in you, and you will do it. You said, well, you will give us the way of escape. You said, you will stand by our side. Whoever is against us, you are already with us. So, Lord, we want to give our lives to you right now, fresh and newer this morning, this Sabbath day, and have you work in our lives Help us to be strong in faith. Help us to be a witness to other people. We have so many people we interact with. To be a witness to other people who are struggling with life and don't know what's going on in this world, we can give them the good news of you and the good news that you're coming back soon and the good news that you died for all and provided salvation for all people if people want to take it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.